Oh, computer. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's... Yeah, I'm glad it's recorded because uh, sometimes uh, my notes are uh, not complete. And... Oh, I'm glad. So you could always go back to the recording. I've been trying to yes. keep up with the recording. So this next one is, it's so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> okay, so let me start with a word of prayer. Dear Scarce's loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us together to study your word, mm -hmm. especially about the prophecy. And mm -hmm. this part, Lord, it, you got me so excited every time I hear mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. And my mind is just like go blown away with just how amazing your, the, your word is and how everything is in harmony, how everything is in parallel. Everything matches and it's just amazing, mm -hmm. Lord. Um, help me to be eloquent, to be able to go through it slowly, um, help us mm -hmm. to find questions where we're, we don't understand, but most importantly, help us to see you in everything. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lord, for bringing us together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So this part is uh, pretty, pretty cool. Let me share my screen over here. There. What happened here? We are in session nine. You could see my screen. Yeah. Hi, yes. Hi. And where is it? There we go. Okay. We're on session nine, um, and I will do a small, one second, small recap. I'm gonna put people here in case people join. All right, so last week, um, if you guys remember, we went over the two times of trouble, right? Do you remember that? It was the um, Satan-induced time of trouble and God-induced time of trouble. Remember that, right? Mm -hmm. and we talked mm -hmm. about when does the first time of trouble start? Um, and uh, in saying that, um, we went over Daniel 11, 40, A and B, right? So we're living right in the middle, right? So mm -hmm. Daniel eleven forty A, the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. This was when the deadly wounds started, right? And then B, is the king of the north will come back against him like a whirlwind chariots mm -hmm. horsemen with many ships, right? This is future. So we're living right in the middle, right? Um, the Bible tells us that the king of the north is basically in, in, in Daniel, in Daniel, because there's parallels, because some people say, well, king of the north, isn't that Jesus, right? It is in Isaiah, right? But we're talking mm -hmm. about Daniel. We're talking about prophecy. We're talking about the... Um, the counterfeit, right? So when Daniel's talking about the king of the north, he's talking about Satan in the threefold union. Remember, we were talking about that. So even uh, in Jesus has, uh, the heaven has uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? We have the triune. While there is the counterfeit, the threefold union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we'll get more into that later on, but you know, this is on a high level. It's basically the papacy, the apostate Protestantism, and it's headed by Satan himself. So that's the threefold union, right? So that's the king of the north that we're talking about in Daniel. We compared the verses describing how, remember, we described how Jesus is going to come in brilliance. We read Isaiah, you know, how it's going to come with all the whirlwind and all this stuff, right? And then we also showed how Satan is going to counterfeit and he's going to copy Jesus's coming, right? Mm -hmm. So Jesus is described in glory that surpasses anything any mortal eyes have seen. And then mm -hmm. Isaiah fell on his face. Remember, that's what we were talking about last week. Satan is going to mimic the beauty, just like Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And then the world is going to fall before him, right? Wow. So this is what we talked about last time. Now we went through the steps um, 
last time, we said Satan appears, miracles happen, miracle leads to the building of the image, which is really important, right? He's going to build an image after all the miracles, and then the image is formed before the close of probation. That's the order that things are going to happen, right? We also went more in detail of who the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites were related, right? Because they said they're going to be coming out. So the Edomites, Moabites, Ammonites, they're related to Abraham, but they're not Israelites, right? They are of us, but they're not of our fold, meaning they are people or other Christian people. Uh, Christ-believing people who don't keep the commandments, but they're out of the fold, right? Because they don't believe in the same thing we do, right? But they are leaving Babylon when they see Satan's deception. So Daniel 11, 40 to 40, I, we studied up to 44. It talks about these steps that we're looking in here. And that's what we talked about last week. So we also, yeah. What do you mean by um, the image was born before the close of probation? What kind mm -hmm. of image? Yeah, so good question. So there's two images when we talk about prophecy. The first image was set up, and I'll talk about this more today. The first image was set up at the very beginning when um, the papal Rome got all of its power. When they talk about image, it talks about a government, a form of government, a form of a new rule, right? So when the papacy back in uh, AD 538, it got all the powers of the military. It got all the powers of uh, the religious power they got all that power, then they, that was a new, so they got all the power to persecute, to change times and law. That was the first image. Mm. The second image comes after Satan comes when he sets up his own new government. So he's going to set up an image, the second image of the beast, right? There's a first image of the beast and the second image. So this picture here is Satan coming, he does miracles. He's going to set up his new government with new laws, like the Sunday law, right? And during all this time, um, the probation is still open. Mm -hmm. Probation is still open because we know the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the people who are also Christians that are in Babylon are coming out because we're preaching. We are preaching boldly because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're preaching to say, no, the Sabbath, Saturday is a true Sabbath. The seventh day is a true Sabbath. And people start seeing the deception and they're coming out. So that means probation is not closed because they still have a chance, right? If probation so will was happen, closed, sorry, it will happen inside the church, right? In, uh, inside different churches, right? Different, so, yes, yes. Yes, exactly, right? And it could be, it could be, so think of it this way. By the time Satan comes, how many religions are there? A lot. How many? How many when, be, before Satan comes? When, when Satan comes. Push? After Satan comes, how many religions are there? Uh, after Satan comes. We don't one. know. <laughs> one. There's going to be one religion uh well let's say two one right one is his he's coming there's no more atheism no more any isms because when he comes as christ everybody's gonna see oh my goodness that is christ the, the whole world follows after the beast remember mm -hmm. the whole world follows him so it's one right except for those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? So, so we're going to have two religions. Exactly. One religion, Satan, and one uh, exactly. remnant. It's, or, it's either one or the other, right? So, so if there's only two, who's coming? Who are the Edomites? Who's coming out? It's everyone 
that initially follows the beast. It's all the atheists. It's all the other isms. They say, oh, this is Jesus and we're going to follow. Yes, he says we need to worship on Sunday. So we're going to worship on Sunday. Everybody, because they see this miracle of him coming down as Christ, right? And then when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we are fighting back saying, this is not the true Christ. God wrote with his fingers, the Ten Commandments, the seventh day is the true Sabbath, right? And then they're going to see Satan as he is. And they're going to say, wait a minute, that's not like Christ. And they're going to start seeing the truth. And then they're going to be coming out away from Satan. And that's when he gets angry. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So um, Satan comes. People aren't sealed yet because they're coming out. There's going to be a great gathering of those who are not true Christians that will become Christians at that time because probation is still open, right? We're not going to be fighting atheism. We're not going to be fighting any other isms, communism, all the isms. We're not going to be fighting them at the end times. We will be fighting the hypocritical Christianity, the apostate Protestantism. Okay, so Protestant, uh, um, apostate Protestants, Protestantism, uh, we said were the, uh, were the Protestants who are not following what the Bible truly says. That's why they call it apostate, they're opposite, right? So as we continue, so that's what we were studying, Daniel 40, uh, 41, 42, 43, right? So um, against the countries. Uh, so I'll get back to 43, but 44, Daniel eleven forty four. 44, it says, but tidings out of the east and out of the north. We talked about this a little bit last week. Tidings out of the east and north shall trouble him, Satan, right? Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. So who's the him? The him is Satan, right? Satan is Christ. So Satan is Christ with apostate Protestantism and the papacy, right? Will go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. The first and second beasts of Revelation 13, they are empowered. So by the time Satan comes, they have all the power back. So at the beginning, um, 538 AD, they got all the power. They got the military power. They got the religious power. So they were strong. Then the dark ages came. They changed the laws. They persecuted, you know, people who didn't uh, do what they told them to do. Then in, um, uh, oh my goodness, that drew a blank. Uh, 17, 1798, um, uh, Napoleon King, right? And then he took all the power away. That was a deadly wound right? So they had no power left. So now Satan comes back. He gets all the power back because everybody's following him. So now he has all the power back to persecute. He has all the power again to change time and law, right? So this is the second beast. So that's the definition of the first and second beast, right? Right now, they don't have all the power, right? If, if they had all the power now, everybody will be following them. They would be able to persecute. They would be able to change the law. So the Pope would come and say, okay, as of today, we are worshiping on Sunday and the whole world will have to do that. They don't have that power. The atheists aren't going to follow them, right? Um, Muslims or Hindus or any other religion will not follow them just because the Pope says, we're gonna worship on Sunday right? Atheists, uh, and I'm telling you, I, this week I was um, witnessing to a friend of mine who's an atheist, and it's really difficult. I sent him um, videos, I, and then I, you know, I said it in love and respect, right? And because he posted something like he mocks Christians, right? Mm -hmm. And so I sent him a loving note asking why, you know, he, he feels that way. Um, 
and he gave me this long excuse and everything. And I said, you know, I respect you. And I said, you know, uh, and then somebody, all of his friends are atheists. So they started jumping on, right? And I was afraid at first to say anything, but when he starts mocking Christ, I can't sit there. <laughs> I can't not do something. So the Holy Spirit kind of, you know, but I said it lovingly. And his friends jump on to say, oh, yeah, you guys are, you know, just uh, it's an emotional thing or, you know, you guys don't. Uh, what else did he say? He goes, yeah, this is a fairy tale and things like that. You know, uh, if you really believe that. And I said, yes, I truly. But it felt so good to say, yes, I believe it, you know, and, you know, and then I was so sad. I was so sad. I felt like crying, not because mm -hmm. of you know, of something that they said against me or anything. It's because I don't want to see them lost. You know, it was so mm -hmm. sad that they can't understand how much God loves them. And if I feel this way, I could imagine how God feels, right? Yeah. He's, done, he's done everything he can. He's mm -hmm. given his only son. Mm -hmm. And yet people still don't want to believe him. And it's so sad that they still mock him. Right. You know, and so the whole world right now isn't going to follow. So they don't have all the power right now, right? It's everything after he comes, right? After Satan comes, Satan's going to get all the power back to persecute, to change times and laws, right? So Ellen White's saying to this point, some of the Adventists have been seen as what they call an alarmist, right? But when this happens, this is what's going to happen. You know, people say, oh, those Adventists, right? Uh, when, because pe we keep jumping on every single news, so we seem to be called alarmists, right? But when we spread the gospel and when we tell them what's going to be happening, and then when it happens, when they see the truth about Satan, right? People are going to say, oh my goodness, those Adventists were right, right? This is what gives the power to the three angels' message. So the three angels' message, what we're studying in Sabbath school, which is perfect timing, right? Again, God's timing is perfect, right? So we're a part of the three angels' message, and we're trying to show the truth. And then the truth, they will have to make a decision, even after Satan comes, because probation is still open. So does that make sense? Yes. Okay. What do you mean by annihilate? Annihilate. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Annihilate means destroy completely. Destroy. Annihilate. Yeah. Annihilate many means destroy and kill many. Annihilate means just there is nothing left. It's completely uh -huh. destroyed. Annihilate. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Keep asking questions. So the order of events, I went through this really quickly uh, last week at the very end. So I know it's small writing, sorry. Um, Satan appears as Jesus, right? So that's what we call the abomination of desolation, right? In Matthew 24, Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand, right? So it's not when you see him, but it's when you see him standing in the holy place or stands where he shouldn't be standing is the abomination of desolation. And don't worry about it right now because I'm going to get into that a lot more later because um, I need to go through some of the basic things first and then we'll break it down. But just remember that. So Satan appears as Jesus, we call his abomination of desolation. But it's not just when you see him. The abomination of desolation is when Satan, you see him standing where he should not be standing. He's standing in the holy place where he shouldn't be standing. So that's abomination of desolation. That's step one, right? Step two, he's going to start performing miracles. That's going to be deceiving the whole world, right? We talked about that. He, then he's going to lead them to create the image, the second image, right? A new society, right? It's a church and state entity, just like the dark ages that we talked about, right? But this is going to be worldwide. So our laws and our 
rights or constitution that we know right now today that we have the rights and the constitution, none of it's gonna be there anymore. It's gonna be null and void, meaning everything's gonna change. He's gonna create his own new society. That's the image that he's gonna create, right? That image of the beast. So the image isn't the image isn't made yet. It's not here yet because Satan's not here yet. But when it's made and he makes this new government, new society, the probation is still open that we just talked about. He'll make a new world order. This isn't before Satan comes. This is after, everybody's talking right now about this new world order. Yes, I hear it on the news all the time. But again, we some the Adventists look at it and say, oh, here's the new world order here. You know, this is what the Pope's trying to do. The Pope cannot do anything with everyone. The whole world will not follow him until Satan comes here because not everybody is Christian. Not everybody follows Jesus, right? Not mm -hmm. everybody has the same beliefs. So even if the Pope says one thing, doesn't mean the whole world is going to follow him, right? So he cannot make a world new order until Satan comes and he does the miracle of him coming down like fire as Christ. Then the whole world looks at him and goes, oh my goodness, those Christians were right. That is the Christ, right? And then he's able to make a new world order. That's the image, right? Um, the new world order is, um, is the Pope will do that? He, he's gonna do the order? The Satan's Pope? gonna do it. The Satan, ah. right? Satan. So the Pope um, cannot do it because even if he tries to make a world order now, not everybody will follow him. Do you no, think, yeah. right, do you think um, extremists, extreme Islam will follow him because the Pope said to do so? Or do you think my atheist friend will follow the Pope because he said something? No, he doesn't want anything to do with him. He doesn't care what the Pope says, right? So the Pope can't make a new world order. The only one that can make a new world order is when Satan comes as Christ, then he's going to join hands with, right, uh, Catholicism and the apostate Protestants. With the three, they will make a new world order, right? Mm -hmm. So this new form of government, church and state, this is when the mark of the beast is initiated. And those who don't follow will be killed, right? You can't buy or sell. This is after he appears. But then this is what happens next. Tidings out of the east and out of the north trouble him. This is Satan, right? We talked about this. Something troubles him from the east and north. And we talked about this last time. The sealing message comes from the east, Right, the Revelation 7, the angel is seen coming from the east with the seal of the living God. Right, the three angels' message comes from heaven, which is symbolically the north. So, tidings come from the north and the east that bothers him. So, Ellen White says, At the commencement of the time of trouble, we went forth to preach the Sabbath more fully, and it enraged the wicked, right? It said it made the wicked get so angry, right? So when he appears, we're still preaching and say, that's not Jesus, right? That takes boldness, right? This, we're, we're talking against the whole world, right? To speak against Jesus is blasphemy. So they're going to look at us and they're going to say blasphemy, because we're not saying that's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're going to use arguments from the Bible, right? Demons, demons described as loved ones, you know, pretending that they're loved ones, right? They're going to, they're going to be coming in and say, of course, that's Jesus. They're going to be telling every, the whole world, all their loved ones, demons are going to come like everybody's loved ones and say, don't listen to those Seventh-day Adventists. They're wrong. 
we're going to have the whole world, including the spiritual world realm, all against us. We're going to be surrounded. Just think of that because there is um, analogy or this is a parallel to what happens in the book of Daniel in Daniel 1 to 4, right? So all of this is happening. Remember I said, you know, we're going to be trying to catch a ball, but there's going to be thousands of balls coming at us we're trying to catch, right? But what's going to be happening is people are going to start leaving Babylon, right? They're going to start looking and say, wait a minute. Why is Satan and everybody trying to kill them? That doesn't sound like Jesus, our loving savior, right? There's going to be something that's not right. And people are going to hear us because it's not us that's speaking. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. We're going to be preaching like you've never preached before. You're going to say things that you've never thought you could say before. We're going to be doing miracles and preaching mightily that people that are following Satan is going to turn on and say, they seem like they're pure. What am I doing here? Then people are going to start leaving, right? And when that happens, great theory to destroy, right? They talked about. The last verse of Daniel 11, 1145, we'll get to that. But this is really interesting. Daniel 1145 is the last verse in Daniel 11. Something happens in Daniel 1145 that Daniel 12, the next verse, makes Michael stand up. Something happens in Daniel 1145, the last chapter of uh, verse in Daniel 11. Something happens there that makes Daniel uh, Michael, stand up. This is pretty cool. This is really, really cool. And I'm not getting to that yet, right? So Daniel 11.45, it says, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So, and I'm not going to explain this yet. This is what happens. Then Michael stands up, right? So verse 40 and 45, for, verse 40 to 45 are the events that lead up to why Michael stands up at the end. And we know who Michael is, right? Mm. Michael's name is used four to five times in the Bible, outside of the time where Daniel, right, um, and his prayers, and Michael came to help him. Remember, Daniel prays, and then Michael comes to help him. Outside of that, every time the name Michael is used, it's used when Jesus is fighting against Satan personally. Even in the book of Jude, Michael and Satan fighting over the body of Moses, right? Revelation 7, Michael and the dragon fought. Okay. Daniel 12, 1, the reason he's using Michael, because Michael or Jesus is going to have a personal conflict with Satan himself, which tells us that Daniel eleven forty 40 to 45 has to do with more than just papacy or apostate Protestantism, it's to deal with Satan himself. This is why Michael stands up, which is pretty cool, right? You guys are following so far? Yes. Okay. Yes. King of the North, do you remember what Satan did when he got kicked out of heaven? Isaiah 14, 13, uh, Sister Darkest, do you want to read that one? Yeah. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Okay. So he said he's going to sit on the north. 
just think about this, right? He's going to sit on the north in the Mount of Congregation, right? He said he's going to be like the Most High. He's saying, I'm going to be God. And that's what got him kicked out of heaven. So Jesus is saying, when you see Satan doing the same thing on earth, the same thing he tried to do in heaven, this is another place. It gets exciting, right? I'm not going to get to it, but you see what's happening there. So he gets kicked out of heaven because he's trying to take over or uh, take the place of God and sit on the north. Mm -hmm. He's the king of the north, described as too, right? And he's going to try to do what he did in heaven is take over who Jesus is. And so all of these parallels are just mind blowing. So I'm gonna to get to a lot of that later, um, but this section, oh, I only got like about 15 minutes. This section, I'm not gonna get through it, but this is so exciting, right? So um, remember I said, Daniel is repeat and expand, right? So we're repeating and adding more and more and more. It's a good way to learn. It's a good way to remember as well too, right? Um, but this, this part of it was a really wow moment for me, right? So let's look at the eight main points of Daniel 11, 40 and 45 and Daniel 20, 21, right? So I try to put it in a table. I know it's kind of small, uh, sorry about that. Uh, let's see here. So there's eight main points that we learn. So Daniel 11, 40, 41, there, uh, Daniel 11, 40. So it said, at the time of the end, the king of the, uh, the south will push at him, right? Meaning the king of the south represents Egypt, right? Or atheism and all that is pushing against king of the north, representing Babylon. That's what we learned. Point two, then the king of the north is going to come back against him, right? So king of the south is coming towards him. And then king of the north come back later on, right? He's going to come like a whirlwind with chariots, sportsmen, with many ships, and he's going to enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over, meaning king of the north pushes back and destroys king of the south. It destroys atheism. It destroys all the isms, everything that's biblical, it destroys, right? Then verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land, right? Meaning after the king of the north defeats the king of the south, he's going to turn his attention back to God's people, to Jerusalem. So this has a parallel to actual history that we're going to go through, right? So, so in history, and we'll go through this. Um, okay, let me, let me finish this first. Okay, so it's going to go towards the glorious land again. And then 44, tidings come out of the east and the north. It's going to trouble him. Right. So from the east and north, there he's going to hear some things and it's going to bother him. And then point five, he, then he's going to go with great fury to destroy and utterly annihilate. Right. Utterly to make a way with many. Then and then verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountain we just talked about. And then Michael stands up and then the king of the north comes to its end. So. This is Daniel 40 to 45 of what's going to happen in the future from everything, what happened in the past, what's going to happen in the future. And this is like, these are the main eight points of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. So throughout the Bible, there's a repetition. So we know that in the Bible, when there's a repetition, it means it's very important, right? like the Sabbath day, like in the Ten Commandments, how many times does it repeat the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day, right? When there's a repetition, it means it's very important. So what we just described in those steps of what's going to be happening, it's in various places of the Bible. And this is God's timing is so perfect because, you know, I do my Bible studies in the morning, I'm reading through, I'm actually at First Kings 18. This was uh, yesterday morning, and I'm, I'm trying to get prepared for this, and I'm reading this, go, oh my goodness, here's another parallel, right? So the story of Elijah and Ahab, remember the, um, at the mount, 
right? Here's a parallel there as well. Ahab says to Elijah, is that you, O troubler of Israel? Right? True followers of God who keep the commandments and his testimony is going to be looked upon that we're the troublers. Right? So Ahab tells Elijah, because Elijah goes to Ahab and says, you're doing something wrong. Then Ahab says, oh, you're the tr person who's causing a lot of problems. In the future that we just study in Daniel 40, 11, we're going to be the ones that he's, Satan's going to say, you're the ones who's causing the problem, right? Then we're going to pe preach boldly and say what Elijah said. I don't know if you remember what Elijah said to him. He says, I haven't troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, is that you've forsaken the commandments of your Lord and have followed the ba bales, right? So we're going to be preaching the same thing that Elijah did. The, we're not the problem. You're the problem. You don't follow the commandments of God, right? And you're following the false Christ, the bales, right? And then so the false even this, even the Sabbath, right? Then Elijah set up an altar and fire comes from heaven. We're going to set up an altar of preaching boldly. The fire of heaven is the Holy Spirit that's going to be coming to us, that we're going to be preaching and doing miracles, showing how God has accepted us and he's helping us, right? Then many people is going to come out of Babylon convicted, Right? They said that, you know, everybody praised the Lord God, right? Jezebel, the scarlet woman, she gets furious when she finds out and she goes out to kill. And when Elijah runs to escape and hide, what happens? God sends his angels to revive and comfort. That's the same thing that's going to happen. That's, <laughs> that's. That's Daniel 40, 11, um, 11, 42, Daniel 11, 42, 45, right? And look at the end. At the end, Jezebel is thrown out the window by her own uh, servants. That is a parallel of Daniel 11, uh, 11, 40, 45, right? Do you guys see it? Amen. Now, there's a lot more parallels in the Bible. But since I just read it yesterday, I just wanted to share that with you, showing yeah. how much harmony the bible is and there's lots of stories god is trying to tell us right mm -hmm. jeff and i'm reading through the spirit of prophecy this is timing right and this morning we're reading about the exodus do you know the exodus has so many parallels to the end times that's going to be a separate bible study that we're going to do because it's mind-blowing there is so many parallels to what we're studying judges i think i told you guys about the story of the harlot exact parallels to Daniel 11 40. Why is it that God is putting these stories in the Bible? He's trying to show us little diamonds and jewels in the Bible to show us what's going to be happening in the end times. He puts it in these stories that when you read it, you're going, oh my goodness, this is ex because now that we're going through slowly, what's going to happen, you're going to read the Bible in a different way. Because now when you're reading the Bible, you're going to find all of these stories that is parallel to what's going to be happening in the end times. This is why the mm -hmm. Bible is in such harmony. This is why light is given to us that it's showing us, right? And it, it's just mind-blowing. But okay, but since we're studying Daniel, we're going to look at the book of Daniel. So we study Daniel 11. I want to show you the beauty of the parallel. Daniel 11, I said, the whole book of Daniel is repeat, expand, repeat, expand, repeat, expand. I'm going to prove it to you because now that you understand Daniel 11, 40 to 45 and 12, 1 and 2, did you know that Daniel chapter 1 to 4 unlocks what happens in Daniel 11? So we're going back to Daniel 1 to 4 and you're going to see the parallel. And this is the cool part. I don't know if I should start because it's going to take me more than five minutes to get through it. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll give you a little bit because we started a little bit late. You guys got five minutes? Yeah, okay. Okay, so 
Um, let's see here. Okay, Daniel one and four, uh, we're gonna start. This is actually right before Daniel, right? This is history. This is pure history I wanna talk about. The king of the south says it pushes against the king of the north. So this is literal history before Daniel one. It says, then Pharaoh, did I put it in here? Yes, here. So let me go back here. Do you see this picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the king of the south, Egypt and all the isms, right? Here's the king of the north and here's Jerusalem. The king of the south, uh, so Jerusalem was having, he, they found out that Babylon's coming. They needed help, so they called the king of the south, Egypt. So Egypt came to help Jerusalem. And then so the Chaldeans, the Babylonians retreated. But later, the king of the north came back and destroyed Egypt. That's in a nutshell. But just to show you something. So the king of the south pushes. So we're looking at Daniel 40. And the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. It says the king of the south representing Egypt pushing at king of the north, right? These are the eight points that we just read. I'm just going to go over the eight points, but I want to show you compared to Daniel 1 and 4. It says in Jeremiah 37, 5, then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt. And when the Chaldeans or the Babylonians that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. So at this point, here you have the Babylonians coming for Jerusalem, the glorious land, right? But Egypt comes to help Jerusalem, right? So Egypt is pushing against Babylon, right? So king of the south goes to war against king of the north. This is Egypt versus Babylon, right? Now, number two says, and the king of the north shall come against them like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, right? So king of the north comes back against king of the south, what we just saw from history, from this is what happened in history. You can read it from Jeremiah, Isaiah. This is exactly what happened, in history, right? So oh, that's okay. And then so this is what, therefore, thus said the Lord God, behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And he shall take her multitude and take her spoil, take her praise, shall be the wages of her army, right? I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor within the servants against it because, because they wrought for me, said the Lord God. Thus said the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, right? So this is... This is talking about the king of the north coming back against the king of the south, right? God said king of the north is going to defeat Egypt. Okay, you guys following? Mm -hmm. So the next point, Daniel 1141, then he shall also into the glorious land, right? So, oh, one more thing. Um, it's Egypt for me. Okay, then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, thus shall you say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me, inquired me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which comes forth to help you. You shall return to Egypt and to their own land, and the Chaldeans should come again and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire, right? against the city and burn it with fire. I think I put it in the wrong place, right? But it says, the king of the north defeats the king of the south. Then after it does that, it's actually going to now, Babylon is now going to go towards the glorious land again, right? He shall enter into the glorious land. After he defeats Egypt, his focus is back on to Jerusalem. Right? Now going to Ezekiel. 
For thus said the Lord God, behold, I will bring upon you. This is interesting. For thus said the Lord God, behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north with horses and chariots, horsemen and companies and much people. Have you read this somewhere before? <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. interesting. He's calling Nebuchadnezzar the king of kings from the north. Mm -hmm. Right? So think of it. Remember the counterfeit, the king of the north? It's not Jesus in Daniel. The king of the north is a counterfeit. It's Babylon. He's calling King Nebuchadnezzar the king of kings from the north, the king of the north. He's coming with horses and chariots and horsemen and companies and much people, right? Here you have Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, referred to king of kings, right? And this title was put to Babylon from the north. So this is the same as referred to in Daniel 11. The only thing missing here is a whirlwind, right? So it's a counterfeit. It's missing something, right? And it says in Daniel 2.37, it says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. So after the king of the north defeats the king of the south, he puts his attention to God's people, the glorious holy land. So this doesn't happen until Egypt is utterly destroyed. So what does it say? God's people won't be the ultimate attack of the king of the north until the king of the south is completely defeated. So when we were talking about Satan coming, Satan's going to first come and destroy all the ism, right? He's going to destroy all the, because no one will, everybody will believe that he is Jesus. There will be no more atheism. There'll be, because seeing is believing. They're going to see this huge miracle. They can't deny this miracle. They see Jesus coming in the clouds with his angels, so-called angels, right? And they're not, they're going to fall on their face saying that is Jesus, right? Just to make a, a note there, Lily. Yeah. On that last verse you had there, that's that's Tyre. It's the city, not I think it said Tyrus or something like that. Sounds like a person. That's that's actually Tyre, T T Y R E, which is the the city, one of the cities, um, I think, along the Mediterranean there, uh, in the um, yes, in the holy in the Holy Land area. Right. Oh, good point. Good point. Yeah, I just I saw that note, Tyrus, and I said I thought that's Tyre, and, and then I looked at I looked at my Bible, and yeah, it's it's Tyre. It's just a it's a misspell. That's all. Ah, uh, gotcha. No, I copied it from. Yeah, he's Kings misspelled version. it. I think. Okay, but thank you, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so um, you kind of see what's happening here. So. When Satan comes, he's not going to be going against the Seventh-day Adventists or uh, the true followers until King of the South, all the isms are destroyed, meaning until the whole world follows the beast. Then when the whole world follows the beast, his focus is going to come back to mm. the boy's land, to the true Christ followers, right? So there is a process he's going to go through, right? Now it's between the king of the north and king of the south, right? That's going to be happening, right? All the isms are those who are anti-Bible, right? Who, who don't believe in the Bible. Even religions that, um, that are anti-two witnesses, right? Um, not taking word of God as authority. Those are the isms that we're talking about. There will be no more because they're going to see and say, oh my goodness, that's Jesus, right? King of the north is going to wipe out Egypt first, right? They're not going to be in connection with it. They're not going to team up or anything. There's no more atheism. There's no more other ism. There's only going to be, if the whole world will be following him. Egypt mm -hmm. will be wiped out. Daniel mm -hmm. 11 is using the parallel to the actual events of history to show what's going to happen in prophecy. So this is symbolic language. 
that's happening in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And it's literally happening in Daniel 1. So um, in Daniel 1, 1, it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Right? So now the focus came back um, to the glorious land. All right. I think I'm going to have to end here. I didn't even get one quarter to the way I wanted to. <laughs> or to God's people, right? What's that? Focus back to, to God's, God's people. Exactly. Which is what is meant by the glorious land. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you see the symbolisms and you see the parallels. So from... Um, from Daniel 11, it, so you understand Daniel 11 a little bit, right? I know um, it gets a little bit confusing. That's why I'm going to repeat it so that you guys understand. But now you can see, I want to get more, there's more parallels in Daniel 1 to 4 that I'll go through next week. But it's, it's just, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy thinking, oh my goodness, how could I have missed this before? Like, how many sermons have I heard with Daniel and Revelation and no one has brought this part clearly to me mm -hmm. like Ivor Myers was the first one that I heard uh, and it just blew my mind like why aren't people preaching this more this is just amazing the parallelism right so we're going to go through that next week so I'll stop here um do you guys Amen. you guys have any questions or learning any slowly sister slowly learning yes Yes, mm -hmm. I want to go very slowly. So I hope this is slow. Or uh, if you know, and if you want me to repeat, I'll be more than happy to repeat. So it's more important for me that you guys absorb it and understand mm -hmm. it. Because when you yeah. do, then you could share it as well, too. So for me, I had to go through this couple of times, a uh, few times, I would have to read through it, say, okay, where does this fit? Where does this go? Okay, well, and Sometimes when Ivor Myers goes through, he goes through it so quickly that, you know, sometimes I, I got lost as well. So I would have to kind of um, put things in different order. And then when I find it, it's just like, oh, my goodness, that's it. That's it. <laughs> so I'm hoping that I'm breaking it down um, in a way that, you know, it's easy to understand. But mm -hmm. please, if, if it's, you know, confusing we could go back and we could look into it more so you guys understand, right? Yes. So don't, don't hesitate Amen. to stop, right? Anytime, anytime, ask those questions. That's important. All right. Yes, you guys awesome. All right, so let's close with the word of prayer. Dear gracious, loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for this amazing lesson. We didn't even touch on the more comparisons with Daniel 1 to 4, which is this amazing. I can't wait till next week and till I could share this and we could take a look at these parallels and just see how beautiful, beautiful, how you wrote everything and how you showing mm -hmm. us everything, Lord. We thank you for loving us so much and the miracles that you create every single day for us. We ask for your mercy and your grace, and we're so thankful for providing for us every single day. Please be with us for the remainder of the Sabbath day, and uh, we have our board meeting tonight, and continue to help us through this week, and help us to prepare as well, too, for, um, for going out uh, to witness to others, and for we pray for the church so that it's uh, quickly finished, so that we could go back to feed the homeless and do do more things for you, Lord. Yes. Thank you for everything. And I thank you so much for Senan and Dorcas and Chuck and those who can be here. Uh, I pray that uh, those who can be here can catch up on the uh, recordings and we could continue next week. Thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, sister. Thank, thank you, sister. guys. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. We'll talk to you guys later. I think oh, quick. Is there this something? is quick. Huh? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, oh, let me stop.